Donnie Darko. Donnie Darko. Donnie Darko. Donnie Darko. What the hell kind of name is that? It's like some sort of superhero or something. Donnie Darko is now a well-known cult film among those who love complex stories, twists and turns, and the unexpected. There is so much crammed into this movie that it can be analyzed for hours by the most dedicated film nerds and still have a few mysteries left to it. It's a mind-bending film with an incredible cast. So why did it fail originally? Could it be exactly because of what makes it an enduring film to its fans? Could it be more complex, like its storyline? So what the f happened to Donnie Darko? I met a new friend. Real or imaginary? Your cup, Donnie. Imaginary. The original Donnie Darko edit, the one seen in theaters in October of 2001, and the one first released on DVD earned an 86% Rotten Tomatoes rating, while the re-release with the director's cut in 2017 got a perfect score. So what happened here? This was so illogical, you know? Yes, there are differences between the two versions, but why was a film that rated high enough in 2001 considered a flop? Well, it seems to have been a lot of different issues compounded together that led it to being considered a flop which, let's be honest, was just a small flop in terms of budget versus box office as the film made its budget back, and a bit more even. But with marketing, publicity, distribution, and other costs taken into account, the film was not much of a success at all. I wanna thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie, and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell, so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. It's just like this ridiculous, fantastic, completely absurd humor, sadness, comedy, and madness rolled up in this ball. Let's look at the numbers. Donnie Darko was made for about 4.5 million US, partially financed by Drew Barrymore's production company, Flower Films. She saw something in the script and not only wanted a part in it, but also wanted to make sure it got made. It has this beautiful, poetic aspect of it, of how these characters are also deep and interesting. The film premiered at Sundance in January 2001 and required a lot of negotiating to make sure it saw the light of a theater. Barrymore was a big player in getting it seen. And Christopher Nolan, with the help of his wife Emma Thomas, were great helpers in this as well. After negotiations and lots of back and forth, the film received a theatrical release on October 26, 2001 in a total of 58 theaters. So not exactly a wide release. Also playing against his success were the other releases that week and a few other events. Some people remarked that Donnie is seen with a gun in the film and it made them worry about the effects of the Columbine massacre just two years before. Then there is a fact of a plane losing an engine at the start of the film. The linchpin of the story really being something that could come off as insensitive so close after the 9-11 tragedy. These two events put together almost pushed the film direct to video, but the folks behind Donnie Darko persisted and the film was released. Every living thing follows along set path. And if you could see your path or channel, then you could see into the future, right? Now, 2001 was a big year for films and there was a ton out in October. Also premiering the same day on the 26th were K-Pax, 13 Ghosts, Bone, On the Line, Ahsoka, Life as a House, High Heels, and Low Lifes which all scored better at the box office and a few more that scored lower. Donnie Darko finished its first week at the box office at number 34. Not exactly a hit. I am sorry that you have failed. Making a total of 110,494 US dollars. That is not exactly something to write home about. However, the film had legs and word of mouth got people to check it out. Given the other films in the US top 10 that week, including Mulholland Drive, Jurassic Park 3, The Fast and the Furious, Moulin Rouge, American Pie 2, and Shrek releasing a smaller film against these titles was a gamble that was almost doomed to fail. So where did Donnie Darko come from? Who's involved? These are elements that help the film become what it is and stay in the collective mind for so long. Richard Kelly both wrote and directed the film. So creatively, it all started with him. Cut. Okay. His third of five films, Donnie Darko, is possibly his better known film so far and definitely led to his next mind of a film which required a comic book tie-in to be able to fully make sense of the story. 
Donnie Darko may not be the biggest box office success, but considering how loved it is now, and how people swear by it even 21 years later, it's the kind of film with staying power, and the film that truly put Kelly on the map. It's honestly too bad that he only directed two other films since, the above-mentioned Southland Tales in 2006 and The Box in 2009. Looking back at his work as a whole, there is something in there, something about his creative mind that begs to be explored more. Speaking with him, the fact that he was able to articulate all the genius that resides inside of him, I was so excited to work under his direction. But he seemingly has stopped making films. Now let's talk about that cast. In the lead is Jake Gyllenhaal, who is more or less known at the time, and not quite an A-lister yet. You can't just lump everything into these two categories and then just deny everything else. His work was getting noticed, and Kelly definitely picked the right lead here, considering Mark Wahlberg was an option and wanted to do the part with a lisp. The public got real lucky here that Gyllenhaal mostly played Donnie as a normal teen with issues and used only a few tricks to throw off the audience, like blinking as little as possible on camera. I love Jake Gyllenhaal. He's incredible, and I swear he is this character. And the more time I spend with him, the more blown away by him I am. His work here is a big part of what makes the film work. The gamble was taken on who should play Donnie's older sister, and picking a Gyllenhaal was a great idea. So the part went to Maggie Gyllenhaal, already a bit of an indie darling at the time. Not only does it help that they look alike, there is something about the sibling relationship that they bring to the screen with them. Please, tell me. We will not have this at the dinner table. Stop. Yes, most actors can fake this, but there's something to be said for actual siblings. Like that sibling rivalry is getting the work done. Jake and I are both each other's toughest critic. So to work together, especially as brother and sister, I think we really demand a lot from each other. And being better than the other that unspoken connection, and so much more. Playing their little sister as Davy Chase, who is darn adorable in this. Why do I have to sleep with Donnie? He stinks. This part almost went to Mara Wilson, who passed on the script because it was too disturbing for her. She was also on her way to retiring from acting, so that may also have played a part in her turning down the role. Sometimes I doubt your commitment to sparkle motion. Playing their parents are Mary McDonnell and Holmes Osborne. McDonnell has been said to be so excited to play the part, she got her first speeding ticket on the way to set. Another indicator of how much she loved the script is that she worked for scale, where her standing in the industry would have called for a higher salary. In smaller, but no less important parts, the viewer can easily notice Drew Barrymore as an English teacher and Patrick Swayze as Jim Cunningham, a man who has made a fortune with his sort of religion-based educational system that is meant to help kids reach their maximum potential. That's what I like to hear. This part is something else, and kudos to Swayze for going all out with it, even providing his own wardrobe from clothes he had retired from the 1980s. Now that was really something. Barrymore, of course, was also a producer, showing that she really wanted to see this made and get released. And last but not least, Frank the Bunny, or just Frank, who is the influence on Donnie, and pushes the film forward more than once. This part went to James Duvall, a mainstay of indie films at the time, someone unafraid to take odd parts and make the most out of them. His work has become something fans cling to and talk about a lot. He created a being that connected with so many with so few lines. Have you ever seen a portal? Add Jenna Malone, Noah Weil, Beth Grant, and Seth Rogen in his first cinematic part. I like your boobs. You've got one hell of a strong cast here. Another aspect of the film that connected with viewers then and still does now is the soundtrack and pop culture references. The filmmaker clearly did his research, adding small details like movie posters that work for the time period. Not all obvious, using Evil Dead in the theater scenes and matching the scenes viewed with the time Donnie was gone from the theater. This use of Evil Dead instead of a typical public domain film, like the overused Night of the Living Dead, was made possible by director Sam Raimi, who agreed to have them use the film at no cost. Groovy. Other references include the Smurfs and how their sex lives would go. Smurfs are asexual. They, they don't even have reproductive organs under those little white pants. Something the publishers of the comics agreed to as it made sense in how it was explained. The use of a fantasy girl like Christina Applegate in the hypnosis scene, etc. These pop culture references set the film solidly in the year 1988. Working with these references are the songs, which were changed a few times during production and release 
due to rights issues and because some of the songs didn't work as well as they could have in director Kelly's eyes. The director's cut changes a few of them and it's something that those who have watched the theatrical release will notice right away. The main songs here include The Killing Moon by Echo and the Bunnymen. Notorious by Duran Duran, Notorious. which replaced West End Girls by Pet Shop Boys in the Sparkle Motion dance number, which thankfully works. And of course the ending, the theme song of the film, basically Mad World by Gary Jules, which is a cover of a Tears for Fears song and which itself replaced MLK by U2. All around me are familiar faces, worn out places, this last song is one that has become associated with the film for just about everyone, and a song that even made it to number one in December 2003. This version of the song is ironic at this point, and so fitting for the film. Anything else just seems wrong. It's a very, very mad so how did Donnie Darko become a cult film? Spawning an absolutely terrible sequel, called S. Darko, all about the youngest Darko sibling. Well, it's complicated and not at the same time. The film was released in theaters at a time when it had a ton of competition. Even its core audience had too many films to check out to see it. Its marketing was pulled due to having a plane incident so close to 9-11, which no one can blame them for. Lastly, the content is not necessarily considered easy access. It is time travel, teenagers having sex, teenagers smoking and drinking, teen violence, abuse of power, sexual abuse as one of the major subplots, and it all takes place in the 80s, a period most film viewers remember with rose-colored glasses. There was plenty here to make most audiences avoid the movie, so it took a while for Donnie Darko's core audience to find it. When the film finally made it to home video in March of 2002, a bit over a year after its Sundance premiere, people started seeing it, and midnight screenings helped it find its people. In New York City, Pioneer Theatre ran it as a midnight movie for 28 months straight. 28 days. Which has to be some kind of record. Midnight screenings attract their own kind of audience. They helped the film get more and more word of mouth, and the rentals for it went up, and so did sales. As for the director's cut, Richard Kelly has said that he sees it more as a special edition of the film. This edition brings back a few cutscenes, adds new visual effects, and moves around the soundtrack. But in general, it is seen as mostly the same film. It does, however, make fans say that this version is the right one, the one where the film makes the most sense and is the easiest to understand. For those who haven't spent hours analyzing the movie, the theatrical release is a perfect place to start and just go with the flow of the film. Of course, this is a movie that is better watched multiple times, possibly even a few times in a row to fully grasp its content. And I have to go back and have to watch it again, and have to watch it again. At this point, plenty online articles have done their best to demystify the movie and pick the story apart for both better understanding and to see if there are any holes in it. A film with this kind of following is one that is undeniably an effective one. Now, whether a viewer likes it or not is an entirely other thing. <laughs>